What are you grateful for? Good evening. My name is AJ. I'm one of the pastors here at Pathfinder, and I want to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. What are you grateful for? This is a great question, and it's a question that is actually pretty common around the mastic dinner table. We, oft, we have four kids uh, from 11 down to four, and uh, this is a, a question we like to ask them. What are you grateful for today? And when you ask kids that young, you have to be prepared for whatever the answer might be. <laughs> um, you know, the, the answer could be, you know, it could be pets. It could be, you know, some sort of game. It's been Pokemon before. It's been uh, food. It's been experiences. You name it. But I love this question because when, when I ask it, you can see the, the wheels begin to turn in my kids' minds. And if I was going to do this exercise with all of you tonight, and we were going to go around the room and ask, what are you grateful for? The, the thought that you were going to have to speak, you, you would begin turning through and sorting through this whole mixed bag that life is. Right? You begin thinking through all the things that happened today or this week and, and begin sorting them into categories. And, you know, what we, what we quickly realize is that some days are great. Some days, right, you got to eat tacos with friends. Other days, you know, your kid puked in the car. Not that that happened to me last week. Um, but you, you begin to think through these things and, and you realize there's times when life is really hard and exhausting and, and unfair and we struggle to find things that we're grateful for, right? Those, the, the negatives pop up in our brains first and we, we have a hard time really latching on to something that we can give thanks for because the, the bad stuff looms large. It tips the scales uh, in, in one direction. It seems to outweigh the good. So much so that when we get so many bad things or, or, or the things that have happened to us, they seem so significant uh, that they outweigh the good. What do we do with those days, with those weeks? We declare them to be bad days, bad weeks, bad years even. And when that's the case, we don't, we don't feel like pretending, and, and, and we don't feel like we should pretend, right, that, that things aren't great, that everything is fine, right? You know, sometimes we do this when people cook things for us, um, and you got to be careful, right? People cook something for you, and you really, you don't like it, uh, but they're like, how is it? And you're like, mm. You know, and it's a careful game. It's a careful line. You got to walk here, right? We know that we should be polite, but but if you say you like that thing, you run the risk that that person is going to make you that thing or buy you that thing over and over again, right? And, and if we say, God, it's all good. We're thankful in the midst of all this stuff, the messiness of life, right? Do we run the risk that God's just going to give us more of the same? Ever since Dion's sermon this past weekend, I've been thinking about this. Um, this past weekend, we, we, in our series, read from Daniel chapter 6. Um, and if you remember, you know, we learned how a man named Daniel, he had political opponents. He, he was a, a big official, and he had these political opponents, and they manipulated the king. They manipulated King Darius into passing a law that really put Daniel in a bind. And I want to reread what happened for us here because I've, I've been chewing on this. And this is Daniel 6. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, should be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Now, if this had happened to you, 
I mean, that's what Daniel did, but I, I don't know about you, if this happened to you, if I were in his shoes, right, feeling angry about the edict, feeling worried about the decree that, that was made, I think my prayers would take on a much different tone. They would take on a, a much more, more fervent tone. I'd be passionately asking God to intervene and to do something uh, about this. I might even sneak in some emergency prayers, right? Uh, maybe, the, I mean, the situation is dire. You know, may, maybe pray that, that, you know, God knocks off a certain king. We can get, just avoid this whole thing, right? But that's not what Daniel seems to do. He, he leans into his, his usual habit of prayer. And it specifically says he gave thanks to God because that was his routine. That was his, his habit. Um, for him, giving thanks to God seems to have been such a, such a central part to his prayer life that giving thanks is synonymous with prayer itself, right? I, I'm sure he did pray for the needs he had, right? But giving thanks was such his routine, it, it was such the predominant tone of his prayers that the, the all of his prayers are just summed up with he was giving thanks to God. And, and I get it, right? We should thank God for all the blessings uh, that he, he gives us. He's the source of every good thing in our lives. I, you know, I grew up in a very traditional uh, Lutheran church. Not all of us did here at Pathfinder. We have people from all walks of uh, you know, faith, but I grew up in this very traditional Lutheran church and drilled into my brain are, are the words of the liturgy, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is surely good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord God, Heavenly Father Almighty. I mean, these, these words are just drilled into to the brain that giving thanks to God is important. It's, it honors him. He's, he's the sovereign. It's right that we give him thanks and praise. But even so, I think about Daniel and I think, how can, how can the tone of Daniel's prayer be thanksgiving in those life circumstances, right? Life isn't just a static thing. Different prayers for different times of life and different needs, right? Uh, the Psalms are full of prayers, you know, with different expressions and, and tones. And, and, and shouldn't we tap into that? Shouldn't we be honest and genuine when we don't feel like giving thanks. And, and that's, that's the sort of thing that I run my, my mind through and then that I think. But scripture actually says that regardless of the time, sure, God doesn't want us faking anything, but regardless of what's going on, you always want to give thanks like Daniel. That in the New Testament, it says this in 1 Thessalonians, and Daniel really embodied this. It says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So to check our understanding here, give what? Thanks, right? In what circumstances? All circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances, including the ones Daniel finds himself in. Whatever the circumstances that you find yourself in, everything good, bad, and in between all circumstances. This is God's will for us because God wants the best for us. He knows that gratitude is, is good for us. It's not just to honor him, but it's something that, that shapes us. It's a way of life, and he, he wants us to give thanks in all circumstances and not reserve it for the times when everything seems right because no Thanksgiving has ever been celebrated in a perfect world. No Thanksgiving feast has ever been held in which the circumstances were perfect. We cannot hold out for that. Around the world, many cultures celebrate something like Thanksgiving, um, usually around harvest time. You know, the community comes together to celebrate the, the bounty of the land, and, and they do so as a community. And, and no matter what people call it or when they've done it, it's always been in the midst of times of hardship because that's our world. You know, for example, this is something that God thinks is really important to us. And so he, he built this into ancient Israelite culture, this rhythm of giving thanks with the feast of Passover. Passover was this feast um, rooted in Israelite history where God says, gather together, you're going to have good food, 
You're going to have good company. You know, nobody should eat this meal alone. And, and it's a meal in which people would sit down and they would tell the stories of God's deliverance and they would give thanks for his blessings. And, and that was a rhythm that God put into their culture for thousands of years to remind them to, to give thanks. And, and you, but make no mistake, right, in the midst of the joy of that is the backdrop of the first Passover, a, a, a backdrop of hardship, of, of slavery in Egypt and, and mistreatment, and God delivers them out of it, and that's the stories that get told at, Pasif- at Passover, um, you know, stories of God's deliverance. But the Israelites never forget that that's rooted in history. It's rooted in a broken world. Or, or we can also think about the first American Thanksgiving uh, which was in Plymouth in what year? Anyone remember? 1621. I heard 20, pretty close. Uh, we generally have a very Sunday school type vision of that first American Thanksgiving, um, you know, type picture of the historic event. But we, we have some of the big things, right? You know, Christians who came over from England on the Mayflower and Native Americans, members of the Wampanoag tribe, did share a meal together. They shared food and they ate as one. And the event, you know, it's always inspired us as Americans because it's a story of very different people coming together. And cross-cultural fellowship has always been a really important part of God's vision for humanity. It's something we should care about and we should strive for. But again, don't forget the historic backdrop of that first American Thanksgiving. The backdrop is this, 102 people came over on the Mayflower, and by that first Thanksgiving, one winter later, only 50 remained. Everyone else was dead. It was literally held, this first Thanksgiving, under the the veil of death and loss. And and by the way, right, the other side of the table, the the Wampanoag tribe, um, today they, they actually publicly, they regret participating in the first Thanksgiving, considering all the harm that later befell their people. Definitely not a perfect Thanksgiving. Or or think about the the first official Thanksgiving holiday in the United States, um, which was November 26, 1863. And here's the proclamation that was drawn up for it by none other than Abraham Lincoln. And uh, it's really good, so it's a little bit lengthy, but I couldn't bring myself to cut too much more from it. Um, But here's the proclamation that made this a federal holiday. The year that it is drawing toward its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties, which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come, others have been added, other bounties on top of them, which are of such extraordinary nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever watchful providence, goodness of Almighty God. They are the gracious gifts of the highest God. Everything he's talking about in his letter, and he expounds quite a bit. All of this, he says, are gifts of the highest God. And it has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, that we the people, that you do also with humble penitence for our national perseverance, 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 perverseness, there you go, and disobedience, commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged and fervently implore the interposition of the almighty God, almighty hand to heal the wounds of this nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes and so on. At the end is where you realize 
He's making this proclamation in 1863. This is smack in the middle of the Civil War. I mean, I mean, talk about celebrating Thanksgiving and being intentional about celebrating it in, in the middle of hard times. I mean, the Civil War is the most deadly conflict in our nation's history. One in 31 Americans would be killed. That's like over 3% of the population, which seems small, but like that's a massive, massive number. Nearly everybody that he is writing to has gone through hard times, has lost people, has made sacrifices. And many of those would be wondering, as we often do, in the midst of such things, God, where are you at? And even in those times, First Thessalonians, and especially in those times, First Thessalonians is given to us. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances because they're the ones we have. Give thanks in all circumstances because it's not just about what's going right or wrong in the world. It's about our posture toward God. Give thanks in all circumstances because in all circumstances we still have so much to be grateful for. And Paul, who, who writes First Thessalonians, he wants to open our eyes to just how much we have to be, to be thankful for. Um, in all circumstances, we can celebrate four things. We can celebrate that God is on the throne, that God is still sovereign, reigning over all things, that nothing happens apart from his knowing or his gaze. We can take comfort that God is good that he wants the best for us, that, that he has actively been working for our good. This is not the, a God who's gone fishing, but a God who is actively engaged in our world, in our lives. He cares about us as individuals as well as us as a people. And he has been working. When, when the people would gather for Passover, that's the stories they would tell, the stories of God's deliverance. And people throughout time have been urged to celebrate God for what he has done. He sent Jesus to, to redeem us. We celebrate that God has been working in that to restore all people back to him, to, to restore this world back to its original goodness so that we no longer have a place where Thanksgiving has to be celebrated together with hardship. He has been working. We can celebrate that. And we also celebrate that God is nowhere near done that God is still active in our world today, in our lives today, that he is present, he's got a plan, that he is working for our good. If it's not good yet, he's just not done yet. He hasn't shown you what he intends to do with it. In all circumstances, no matter what, we can celebrate these four things at a bare minimum. But what's amazing is, from these things, our thanksgiving can only grow. I mean, when you, when you think about those four things, I don't know about you, but for me, like I think the, the more you become aware of them, the more I'm reminded of those things, the more then they unlock other things I should be grateful for and other things that I can celebrate. If God is all powerful and he's good and he's, he cares about me as an individual and he's working in my life and he has, he has things that he's doing in my life that I don't even know how they're gonna resolve yet, but they're gonna be good, then suddenly for me, the, the scope of what I have to be grateful for begins to expand. It becomes this, this powerful ripple effect. Like if all these are true and they are true, then I have so much more to be grateful for, uh, that they open my eyes to all the things, all the blessings that I've received that I don't deserve of house and home and friendship and vocation. All these then I suddenly realize are from God. He, he is the source of all of them. Uh, you know, I, I suddenly just realize that, that man, everything, all the good that I, that I have in my life, I, I owe to him. And all of, all of the things in the world where he's helping me to catch a glimpse of true beauty, of true, true goodness, of, uh, of something pure, that that's a, nothing other than a, a glimpse of God at work. And it just blows my mind that when we engage in, 
in gratitude. It leads us to these truths, and then it leads us to more gratitude. It begins this feedback loop of gratitude. When we, when we dedicate time to thanksgiving intentionally as a rhythm, as a habit, it just begins to loop and loop and loop. It's a way of life that leads us into more and more gratitude. It leads us into peace in the midst of a messy world. And God, was, he knows that we're so prone to forgetting. That's why he institutes rhythms and habits for us to be reminded, like Passover, um, like when Jesus met with his disciples and celebrated the Passover, and he supersedes it with communion, which, which he calls us to celebrate regularly. He also connects that with this idea of giving thanks. In Luke 22, it says, Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after his supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But this whole communion meal, which we celebrate regularly in worship, is, is something in which we continue this practice of giving thanks. We're, we're reminded of all that Jesus has done for us in dying and rising again to, to redeem us, to, to bring us into life, that we might have life to the full. It reroots us in the story of God anytime we engage in not only the Lord's Supper, but worship in general. These are rhythms of thanksgiving that God has given us. They overflow into life. They give us joy from which to navigate the rest of life. And I think this is why Daniel knew that he had to keep up his habit, that he, that he had to, to give thanks, that he had to take the intentional time to, to center his mind on God because he, he just knew that gratitude unlocked. It was the key to his survival in Babylon, in Persia, uh, you know, that it unlocks not just survival, but a, a way of thriving because it's a way of going through life, just looking for the blessings of God, looking for his goodness toward us. And, and I think, think, you know, back to the original question, when Daniel gives thanks to God in the midst of such evil circumstances, right? Is that dishonest to the ugliness of the situation? No. It just, it's a shift in focus. Daniel knows where to focus. And I think some of you have this figured out too, and maybe, maybe way ahead of me. Uh, is there anybody in here that would say, this, the Thanksgiving is your favorite holiday? Okay, we got a couple people. Yeah, okay, you know. My, my stepdad, John, he was one of the, the first people in my life, the first crazy people that I met to say that Thanksgiving is better even than Christmas. And I'm like, how dare you? Um, but, but there are those people out there. There's some of you in this room. I, I'm, I might even, you might be slowly winning me over too. Um, but there, there are people who love Thanksgiving as the pinnacle of, of the holiday season. My stepdad, John, is one of them. I texted him a couple days ago and, and I said, hey, could you just tell me like, why is it that you love Thanksgiving more so much? Like, what is it about it? And, and he said, I've got so many things to be thankful for. I've been really blessed, blessed by my family. I love having everyone here, getting people together. It gets harder as they get older and so on. And then he says, I still remember fondly the Thanksgiving in the hotel in Arkansas which was like 15 years ago, but my parents came down, they celebrated Thanksgiving with us. And for some reason, we, we celebrated it in a hotel, which you cannot make the world's greatest feast in the hotel. I'm just gonna say that. But, but why is it that John and people like him and others have latched on to, to Thanksgiving as such a meaningful holiday that, that, that regardless of circumstances, like that even Thanksgiving in a hotel with like TV dinner, Thanksgiving prepaid, like that somehow, that's an amazing memory. And I think it's, it's because Thanksgiving doesn't carry some of the weight that our culture has placed on the Christmas season and the hustle and the bustle and the, the, the you must have nostalgia and happy times and good memories. And there's, there's all this, this stuff that 
our culture is trying to monetize and pack into Christmas. And, and with Thanksgiving, and again, I'm not dogging on Christmas. I love Christmas. And to be, to be clear, uh, when I was a kid, I thought John was crazy. So um, to get that out there. But the emphasis with Thanksgiving, it, it doesn't have some of those things. The emphasis is just on the power of Thanksgiving to renew our hearts. And so I hear God calling me this Thanksgiving. I don't know what uh, you hear him calling you to, but in the midst of whatever life circumstances, be you on a high, be, be it a low, a valley, whatever it is, I hear God calling me where I'm at to give thanks. And, you know, as I reflect on the past year, you know, um, my, my daughter has had this cancer journey and she's doing well, but um, that definitely was not in my plans for life. Um, and there were all these trickle-down effects to that too, right, that have come for the family. My wife still carries this huge burden. Um, my, the siblings carry a burden. And, you know, there's my own anxieties in the midst of it. And I just hear it, God calling me in the midst of all of that going like, just, just be grateful. And man, through all of it, he's been showing up, right? I, he's been on the throne. God has still been good. He, he's been re revealing himself, working in the midst of all of that. So much so that Megan and I, we just now we're like in the midst. It's been a heck of a year, but at the same time, like we have so much to be thankful for. And there's times I'm tempted not to be, but I hear God calling me like, just be thankful. Don't let the circumstances create a barrier to you embracing the wholeness of all that God has in store for you. Be thankful, keep your focus on God and on his blessings, his benefits and goodness. And, and so what about you? Back to our original question, what are you grateful for? What is it that God is calling you to, to shift your focus toward? Uh, is there a circumstance that, that he's calling you, like don't let that get in the way? Is there something that he says, just no matter what, let gratitude be infectious this Christmas season. May this, may gratitude be the tone with which it, the, you look at the rest of the season. May it be the glasses you wear. May it be what, what is in your every step as you enter into these next five weeks heading up to Christmas. And, and I encourage you to just zero in on that, to lock in on whatever God is bringing up in your heart or in your mind in this moment. Find a way to verbalize it. This is a way we can just make Thanksgiving so much more powerful. We can really tap into the spirit of the day. It's just, when you gather tomorrow, find a way to verbalize what you're grateful for. Maybe even invite others to, to verbalize their gratitude as well. And in doing so, to set the tone for the whole rest of the season. It's a season where we get swept up, but may we not be get, getting swept along by by worries and fears and it's got to be this way and meeting all of our needs but may we through gratitude be reminded that our greatest needs have already been met in Jesus he's so good he's got a whole lot more he wants to show us and for that we can be thankful God we thank you today just that you've gathered us together as a people, that you call us out of the world if for only an hour, just to celebrate your goodness, to, to have our hearts and minds tuned back toward the things that we can all, always celebrate, the things that are intrinsic to your nature and your work in this world, to recognize, Lord, that in spite of the bad, it never outweighs the good for us in Jesus. And we don't disregard its impact, but at the same time, Lord, you call us to shift our focus toward those things, Lord, that are blessings, those ways in which you've been so good to us in mind-blowing ways, far beyond what we ever imagined or deserved. Help us to be more attuned to your entire goodness for us and your grace and mercy for us more and more attuned each and every day, and especially as we take time to give thanks tomorrow. Lord, we pray that you would just give us so many reasons to smile, 
to look around and to be grateful. May our hearts be warmed by your spirit and ultimately may we find our gratitude in you. Amen.